Well, the Nations Cup moves north this week to Dundee in Scotland, and I must say, a pretty breezy Dundee it is too. And conditions probably not dissimilar to those 98 years ago when Captain Scott set sail for more northerly territories. An all-wool race in the foreboding but beautiful shadow of Brotty Castle on a day of gathering cloud and increasing westerly squalls. And this, the battlefield where all will be won or lost, not quite as great a task as undertaken by Captain Scott nearly 100 years ago, but nevertheless in the increasing swells, pretty uncomfortable all round. And the Warriors, they all fear on the day in A-class these days, Ian Sanderson with new co-driver for the weekend, John Mitchell. The early cloud thinning a little now, but the freshening wind still promising a pretty bumpy ride. And out in the Mustra area, a wee taste of the conditions with Scotland's Rob McTavish. And the view looking the other way, this time with Brian and Pat Padell, equal fourth so far. And good money for it. And here they go on the run in, led by the circling start, but on the left of the picture, on board with McTavish. The start boat taking them in a straight line, a stern yellow flag aloft, building up the speed to around 30 miles an hour. And then when the starter deems no one has an unfair advantage, yellow is replaced by green, and away they go. Brian Fidel with an early taste of what he's up to facing in the next 40 or so minutes. And there they go. And Padel right up there in the middle with the leading group. Sanderson in the red boat just nudging ahead, I think. Matt Shepard and James Marshall on board with them, also in that leading pack. And Sanderson definitely beginning to pull away a little bit here. Certainly 70 miles an hour or so as the helicopter spins across the fleet. Number 10 is Martin and Kevin Rendell, Wyco Industrial, but the angle's deceptive because here comes the fabulous baking boys. John Mitchell getting his first taste of high flying with the high flying company boss Ian Sanderson. They lead. And there's Brian Padell, super strike into second ahead of the much improved Brett Dancy, 27, far side. Graham Hastings, number three, near side there. No points in the Nations Cup as yet for Dancy. Padell. Here, fourth on 447, Hastings third on 491. And that's the gap. Sanderson left, Padel right as they head south across the Tay Estuary now towards Mark II. The advantage around 150 metres. Back with Brian Padel, drives with wife Pat alongside. Into Mark II, turning eastward. Sanderson tight on the boy. Padel in his wash, the rest stream through. Hastings is away from Dancy, who makes a super mark, picking up most of the ground he lost, getting to it. Shepard is four, Sterling fifth, and Ian Blacker there on the inside coming through. The 1996 champion almost clipping the mark as he made up ground. But it's Sanderson and Mitchell, ground speed on the helicopter, just on 81 miles per hour. And in spite of three wins out of three so far, Sanderson in no mood to take things easy, even if he does have a new co-pilot. Be interesting to know what the new co-pilot's thoughts are. <laughs> the speed sensation when racing on water is twice that of land. So at 80 miles an hour, it will feel something like 160. Down a cobble street in your car with the tires flat and your head poking out the sunroof is a popular description. Ian Sanderson once said it's like a biological oh, yeah. pre-wash followed by a rinse and a spin. Well, he should know. So far, after a three-year campaign, it's seen him crown national European and world champion, so he knows what it's like to be in the rough and tumble at the front. Coming now into the end of lap one, this time through the chicane, 
3.4 miles completed in 2 minutes and 35 seconds, and I make that an average speed of 71.84 miles an hour, and that's quite remarkable. John Mitchell over the shoulder, looking at second position, and it's Graham Hastings ahead of Brian Padell. That's a great lap for him. Blacker, Rendell and Dancy are next. This is for seventh. And it's Ian Sterling left, Rob McCarthy on the right, and Rob McCarthy is over in spectacular fashion. Well, what was that all about? Both crew out of the boat, appear to be OK. And the other boat's slowing down just to make sure the crew are OK before safety gets there. Those are the rules of racing in offshore. And away goes Andy and Graham Gittings, Matt Shepard stays on station. Let's take another look at the rerun and McCarthy looking in good shape and suddenly the boat slewing round to the right. The inertia throwing the crew clear and rolling the boat completely over. Well, thankfully both McCartney and his co-driver Roy Trot seem to be okay. Here's Sterling now out on his own there in seventh. Meanwhile, Brian Patel, after that early second, finding himself under pressure from number 27, Brett Dancy, whose confidence grows race by race. No lack of confidence here. Coming in at the end of lap two, Ian Sanderson and John Mitchell still setting the pace. Coming into the chicane, the lap time is 2 minutes 42. That's seven seconds slower than lap one. Average speed then just under 70 miles an hour now. And there's Hastings, still in second place, 69.27, his speed. And it's a luxury they can afford after that start for Sanderson and Mitchell. Brothers, Martin and Kevin Rendell in the revolutionary hydrolift, built with much flatter stuff than this in mind. They're in eighth, which I suspect they would consider quite respectable. And back into the rougher stuff, Dancy's still ruffling the feathers of Brian Fidel's Nippon Express. He's been sat there for almost a lap, gently building up the pressure, and here he goes, turning the screw, might be a nautical way of putting things. Brett Dancy moving into third with a timely little burst, just on 80 miles an hour. Oh, but he's up there, and Brett Dancy almost buys it. Let's Brian Fidel back through on the inside. Well, Dancy almost got the nose in there, allowing Ian Sterling to join in the fun. Well, getting himself back into reasonable shape here as Ian Sterling makes another bid. Oh, and a chance to look at it again. Brett Dancy just a little unlucky, riding high at 80 miles an hour. His trip there, by the way, almost pays the price and certainly cost him that third place. Lucky to survive that one, and Brian Fidel then, finding himself with a little clear water to enjoy. Not exactly comfortable, though, is it? It's a rough old sport. And right on his water once again. Brett Dancy getting his act quickly together. He'll have to put the incident a minute or so ago out of his mind. That isn't easy. And following a slow start by their standards these days, number 70, Derek Basham and John Cook. Tucked in behind Mark Priestley, we saw go through. This is ninth for the South Devon crew, who finished third and fifth in the two Bangor races, and that was enough to lift them into sixth overall. They're followed into the mark there by Ian Vautier, that is from Jersey. Seventh in Bangor, his best so far for number 44. Back on board with Matt Shepard and James Marshall, two sevenths and a six in the three rounds so far. Only good enough for seventh overall. Having said that, quite a few would swap it for what is a high-quality fleet these days. That's Martin Bull at the end of his second lap. And it's first place in the 1.8-litre division ahead of Vicky Crump and Sue Catchpole. Oh, there they are. Vicky Crump stepping up into B-Class this year after winning C-Class last year. And doing pretty well, too. In fact, pulling up a little bit there on Martin Bull. Rob McTavish and Neil Cameron still suffering in 10th. A trim problem, I would suggest. The boat not handling at all well. Now, well, that is a very rough ride indeed. Compare it with Ian Blacker here and Stuart Porter. Perfectly balanced. Able to travel something like 10 miles an hour quicker than McTavish because they're trimmed correctly. 
And incidentally, beginning to close things down on the leaders. Moving up into third place, I think it is now for Blacker. And catching up on C-Class, Eddie Basham in second position here. Leads the championship, but not the race. The girls, Sharon Attlee and Jackie Porter, 41, are already through. 49, Christian Auger and Kevin Hoare also threatened Basham's early season dominance. So he's got his hands full. Sanderson almost round again, has been forced to pick up the pace again. Graham Hastings, the main predator at the moment, but the increasing presence of Ian Blacker will probably be the major concern. He is definitely now in third position. Graham Hastings, fourth at South End, a superb second in Bangor, Northern Ireland. Knows Blacker has the better prepared boat for the rougher conditions. Sanderson still leads in the A class, but Hastings is no longer second. And this is why Ian Blacker and Stuart Porter passing them on lap four and now right up behind Sanderson and Mitchell. Is there perhaps one more twist to the tail yet? Sanderson through, coming up to the end of lap, almost lapping Andy Gittings, who's second in the championship. A little too choppy here for the light Argo. Plus the fact that Gittings stopped at the scene of McCarthy's mishap to check they were OK. And that cost them some time. And as we said, those are the rules. First competitor on the scene stops to assist if required. They are then awarded the position they held at the time of stopping, should they drop back. And talking of dropping back, Brian Fidel has dropped from second to seventh, so there's a mechanical problem with him. He will be lapped as well by Graham Hastings, number three. This is second, and the blacker charge to the front continues. Sanderson's only just ahead here. There is Sanderson, and Sanderson almost makes a complete hash of that. Here comes Blacker. Now then, is this the break the Reading man was looking for? While Sanderson and Mitchell amid a flurry of spray, weaving and twisting their way back into some sort of order and just about getting the act back together before Blacker was through. Let's take another look, and it's the pressure applied from Blacker that set Sanderson up for the error. But Sanderson with Blacker storming in behind, doing well to get things quickly under control. Having said that, it probably seemed like a long time before that boat settled back into his rhythm. And Robert McCarthy, none the worse for wear, a little damp, no doubt, leaving the chores there to Roy Trott, the boy with the wicked sense of humour. I wonder what he was saying. I think I bailed you out enough times already, McCarthy, must be the comment. Back at the front, Blacker still hunting for 400 points. Sanderson still holding on as time begins to run out a little for the challenger. Sanderson once again finding that vital mile an hour at the right time. Blacker, on the other hand, will have been encouraged by the enforced error earlier on the lap. So he'll be pushing up once again as they approach the chicane into the back marker traffic. Just about 50 metres, I would say, the difference. Let's catch up with Robert McCarthy. What happened? Um, all happened very quickly. Uh, one minute we were sort of gaining places very rapidly. Next minute we're swimming in the water. Unfortunately, the um, River Tay is possibly not the cleanest in the world, but uh, I think we've survived. <laughs> you any idea why? What, why we survived or why we ended up in the water? <laughs> It's just one of those things, I think, uh, whether the boat hurt or something broke, something gave, don't really know. But it does happen that quickly, doesn't it? Very. Um, barely chance to take a breath before you hit the water. I think we were possibly doing, I don't know, heading towards 70 mile an hour when we stopped at a very short distance. Every driver's fear and one faced on more than one occasion by Ian Blacker. You only race to win is the motto. Percentages play no part in his strategy. That's the gap there. Moving back, and the problems mount for early front runners Matt Shepard and James Marshall, round about 10th. They also stop for McCarthy. And I would say now suffering from lack of power. Much the same goes for 17, Lee Moxham and Gloria Stevenson, Oceanarian. Bright start for them again, dimmed with problems in the powerhouse, it would seem. 
Andy and Graham Gitting scrapping their way back to eighth. Just to remind you, they also uh, stopped for McCarthy. But not a good day for the crew, second in the table. No joy either for the Rendles, back now to 11th. Such a force last year in the championship. That was in the immaculately prepared heavy water Phantom. That season, incidentally, was predominantly flat. That prompted them to change to a lighter, faster hydrolift. And this has been a predominantly rough season. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't win. A thought probably echoed by Ian Sterling and A.D. Dickinson, 15. Arguably the sport's biggest fans on the water. So near to championship success, too. That was two years ago. But struggling these days. Back to the start-finish line and Martin Bull and Dave Gallivan. Gallivanting nicely towards a fourth successive win in the series. And all but tying things up with four to go. And by the way, the Nations Cup being run this year is a prelude to a full Five Nations Championship next year. It still lacks competitors from both France and Wales. But with each nation hosting rounds this year, it's hoped to generate sufficient interest on the water to achieve that full status next time round. As down the finishing straight for the penultimate time, flies Ian Sanderson at full tilt, pursued in vain surely now by Ian Blacker, who in spite of a continued presence has failed to mount a serious challenge during the last lap. And that is as much down to Sanderson's ability to extract that little bit extra when necessary as Blacker's recognised talent in the one-to-one -one dogfight. Tight there, Sanderson, in the chicane, number 55, negotiating that for the last time, and a chance now to compare Sanderson with our earlier look at Blacker. Similar boat, same style, nicely balanced, minimum of movement, keeping the boat in the water. The recipe for success. Just half a lap or so left then to add another string to a considerable bow. Four successive wins in any sport is to be admired, but perhaps especially in this competition. Horrendous conditions in both races at Bangor, followed up here with a difficult racing surface at best. That's required something special. And as we said earlier, a quality lineup. So down the finish straight, they come for the final time. Blacker 200 metres astern, having finally conceded defeat after that brave fight back. And what I wonder might the position have been had he made a better start. Well, that we shall never know. So Sanderson crosses the line in first position for a spectacular victory. The rest stream in among them, although we didn't see them, Sharon Attlee and Jackie Porter. Totally dominating C-Class ahead of Eddie Basham and Rob Perry. So, this is how they are after round four.